Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Straight Talk from Out Show. My name is Bruce Wilson, the Executive Director of Service Render Incorporated, and Straight Talk from Out is one of our programs that we have within, among many programs we have within under Service Render um, Incorporated. And Straight Talk just happened to be one of our cable shows. You know, we it's basically being straight with yourself and talking to the community, members of the community, and t about um, what's good. You know, information up to that you might want to share to people, to our audience, and important stuff. So today I'm here with Boy Yang, who is also who is the Human Rights Commission, Commission Executive Director. How how important is that, man? That's an <laughs> important job. So let's just get started, um, Boy. Um, so first of all. Um, I don't know if you was born and raised in here in Vermont, but many people when they look at me and say they say, Bruce, um, you know, what were you what brought you to Vermont? You know right. what I mean? So, yeah. so so were you born born in Vermont? No, I was born in Laos. And my family came here in nineteen eighty as refugees. My dad had fought in the war in Vietnam and so had assisted the um, United States in that war. And when that war was lost, um, our family amongst a lot of our people were really abandoned there. And so we had to do this trek uh, across the country and across the river and to Thai refugee camps. And then we're finally sponsored to come here. So that's sort of like the early years of my life. Um, and we actually settled in Chicago for yes, a couple of years yes. and then we moved to Wisconsin and I pretty much grew up in Minneapolis oh, wow. and um, that's where I uh, probably would call my home away from home. Sure. Um, I kind of think of myself as someone who has many homes and so yes. and so many nice. identities too yeah. in that sense and so um, yeah so I grew up in Minneapolis and yes. about yes. six years ago 2015 um, I met my husband there, we had our kids there, and he had gone to college out here and wanted to come back to Vermont just because of how beautiful it was. And I was at that point in my career where um, it made sense to try to do something new and different. And so um, I was really in for uh, a change, I suppose, and boy, did I get it. So yeah. yeah. So you know, you know I'm from Chicago, so yeah. you know, I gotta represent, you know. Yeah, absolutely. And, um, well, I'm, all the time somebody say, what, what brought you, ask me, what brought you from New York? I'm like, oh man, oh, don't, <laughs> don't stereotype me, you know what I mean? Because New York is around the corner or whatever. Yeah. You know, I like New York, whatever, but you know, why can't I just come from Chicago, right? right. Why can't I come from Chicago to Vermont, whatever? But I also lived in uh, Minneapolis, you know, uh -huh. um, and they got that little motto of ten, over 10,000 lakes. I'm like, come on, man. <laughs> Yeah. Really now? Over yeah. 10,000 lakes? You know? I, I think it's more. You think yeah. It's, that's what someone else told me. Yeah. God, yeah. I, just can't, I just can't see it, you know what I mean? I'm like, I don't see it, you know, but yeah. there it is. I, stayed, I lived there for like three years, you know, in Golden Valley, but yeah. I don't even knew it was you know, Lake Calhoun, Lake Minnehaha, you know, so I, those are lakes I usually hung out around, you know. But anyways, um, so what does an uh, executive director of Human Rights Commission do? Yeah, so the... The job is one where I wear many hats. Um, obviously, the most obvious is I'm the head of the agency and so the appointing authority. And so in addition to all the budgeting and administrative work and, and stuff, I supervise in, uh, the investigations and the investigators who are staff attorneys who are really investigating the claims of discrimination in the three primary areas, which is housing, um, state government employment and places of public accommodations. And I would say that that's probably one of the most important things that we do is enforcement of the anti-discrimination laws in those three areas. And a lot of people don't know what places of public accommodations mean, um, but that really means every place that provides goods and services to the general oh, public. I didn't know either. Yeah, so that means schools, mm -hmm. hospitals, roads, even prison systems. And so that's a huge like, area. That's almost everything if you think about yeah, it, really. um, except for maybe people's homes. But even we have jurisdiction over housing. 
housing discrimination. And so um, enforcement is a huge piece in supervising and investigating those, uh, those investigations. Um, I do a fair amount of public um, education and outreach too, along with our director of policy education and outreach. And during the legislative session, I testified before the legislature um, in support sometimes and sometimes against or critical um, of various bills that might come up. Okay. Yeah. Wow. So, and I, we talked a little earlier about this, you know, um, 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 Karen Richards, your predecessor, right, was, um, came out to our, um, we, we asked her to come to an event at UVM at the yeah. Davis Center to, uh, it was called Know Your Rights. And so many students came there to hear, she did a PowerPoint presentation, and it's about all the things you just said, housing, and mm -hmm. do, are you do anything about voting too? Do you do voting? We don't do, um, it, we could, that could potentially fall within our jurisdiction, but not typically, yeah. yeah. And so um, many, in, in many um, youth in, who was that attended it from um, UVM learned a lot, and I did too, because yeah. man, you know, and the, and the thing was like, know your rights. So we, I, I thought, I didn't really know my rights either until she did that presentation yeah. and talked to us about it. So, so I just want to, you know, thank you, uh, Human Rights Commission, for, for, for being, you know, being there to help us um, get educate you in yeah. an in, in adult suit like me, you know. So, um, what is the anti um, discrimination laws? What, what is, what is that? What, what are they? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So these are the laws that um, we have state anti-discrimination laws and federal anti-discrimination laws that basically Congress and our legislature here has put into place that says discrimination is prohibited. Here's the shape and form that it takes and these are the places where we're not going to permit it, mm -hmm. right? So basically you can discriminate however you want within your home, mm -hmm. privately, who your friends are, but for the most part, we believe that as a society that is just and moral, that there should be no discrimination. And so people's rights to access housing should be free from discrimination. And people's rights to access employment should be free from discrimination. And people's right to get go to the grocery store or go to a hospital to get services. These are all places that we believe should be available and open to everybody, regardless of their race, color, gender, gender identity, sexual orientation, disability, and so forth. And so the anti-discrimination laws pretty much are the laws in place that prohibits discrimination in all of these areas that are meaningful to our lives. Awesome. So uh, <clears throat> when, when you say um, you help with, I guess you help with the policy work too? Or yeah. You, mm -hmm. So how, how, do you, how, can you help, how do you help with help policy work? So, um, as you probably know, Bruce, lots of bills are introduced every year. Yeah. And some of those bills, um, a lot of those bills are probably very important. Not every bill is taken up, but um, the work that I do really is to support the legislature in clarifying how those bills would have an impact on people of, in Vermont, particularly people of color, uh, people with disabilities, LGBTQ people, um, anybody that really would fall within our jurisdiction. And so um, there are many bills like that. One of those bills is um, H329, which is a bill that has been introduced that really seeks to change those anti-discrimination laws that I've talked about. Right. Yeah. And um, is it okay if I explain it a yeah, little bit right about it? Yeah, no, no, so, because that's one of the things I want to talk to you yeah, about. Yeah, yeah. So, H329. One, H329 is a bill that does two really important things. The first one is the easier part to understand. Right now, when someone has experienced discrimination, they can file a lawsuit under our current state laws within three years or six years, depending on their loss meaning the damage and the harm that it has caused to them. Uh -huh. Most people don't understand, do I have three or six? This law changes it so that everybody would have six. It would be a very clear standard. That's the easier part to understand about the bill. The other part about the bill that is really important is that it actually seeks to change the harassment standard under all of those areas that I talked about. And so what is harassment? Harassment is like a hostile environment um, that someone experiences because of their race or gender or gender identity or sexual orientation. Right now, there is a gap between what we find uh, 
morally repugnant and what the courts find actionable, meaning what the courts find would be a ro legal wrong. And so I'll give you an example, right? So is it okay if I use you, Bruce, as an no, example? No, 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 Let's no, no, no. say, Bruce, you apply for a job and you, um, you're excited, you're ready to start this job, um, and you get in and on the very first day, one of your colleagues makes a jokes with you and uses a racial epithet. R very wrong. Very wrong. Very wrong. It makes you so uncomfortable you, I don't know how you feel, but when when other people experience discrimination, it makes me angry. When I feel, when I've experienced discrimination, it saddens me, it demoralizes me, it hurts me greatly. I think that I would probably go home and like question, did I do the right thing? Did I take the right job? Why did this person do this? Was that a joke? Am I being overly sensitive? These are the things that people right. of color I, say to ourselves. I, and I, and I, I, we yeah. preach into the choir here. I feel, yes. I think I feel the same way. Yeah. Probably even more. <laughs> right. You and know. then um, let's say nothing happens and a couple months later your boss uses a racial epithet. Okay. Now that's two months in between these two racial epithet. But now you've got these two incidents that have a real serious like impact on your ability to do your job, your f ability to get up in the morning and like feel good and prepared to do that work and to go to work every day. And then maybe six months later, um, you know, people are listening to certain types of music and they're repeating that music at work. And then now they're using like let's those racial epithets that are used and they think it's okay to do that. Right. And now you've heard it three times. You file a lot, like you no longer feel comfortable working here. Right. No, totally no. morally repugnant. Most of us would say that is not okay. That is not acceptable. You quit because you have no choice. Like this is no longer right. a safe place for you right. to work. You quit, you file a harassment claim, you would probably lose. Because the courts say that those three incidents in which someone said these things, well, y you didn't lose your pay, you didn't lose your job, you quit. And also, is this really hostile, right? So the court uses this standard called severe or pervasive. It has to be so severe and usually like a verbal racial epithet by well, itself. What like the N-word? What about that? Right, is that, exactly. That, that don't mean nothing, right? Well, it, it, uh, well, uh, well it means a lot the, to me. It means a lot to all of us. It means a lot to society, too. But to courts, it doesn't necessarily. They say you should be able to sort of brush that off. <laughs> and so the standard right now is something has to be so severe right. They've interpreted it to be so severe, or it has to be so pervasive. It has to happen so often, so frequently, and yet they don't set a standard for how often it has to happen. Mm -hmm. This bill seeks to change that and to close the gap between what offends us as a people and what the court has, has set as the standard. Right. It says, no. This is the legislature taking a position that what the court has done and what the standard that the court has set for harassment claims needs to change to reflect what really is morally repugnant. And this bill would change that standard and broaden the scope for people to be able to file those claims of discrimination in where we live, in employment, and at schools, and in places of public accommodations, all those places that I talked about. So this is probably the most important bill in my work of this time, and I think that if our legislature is bold enough that it could get it done and so um, so, so what so what does it mean when you say um, um, you, you know uh, this h329 is like a, a fight against the prohibition against discrimination mm -hmm. I mean what does that mean prohibition against discrimination yeah well it's probably everything you said but the word prohibition I guess out um, in with um, against discrimination, kind of that's what gets me. Um, yeah, yeah. So the the bill itself is called uh, an act that seeks to change the prohibitions against discrimination, and all that really means is that this is a bill that is going to change the way that we look at our anti-discrimination oh, laws. Okay. That's it. Okay. Yeah. So, um, <clears throat> so um, can you talk, talk to me a little bit about uh, explicit bias trainings that that you um, I think um, state of um, state employees might might have went through with yeah, part of you? Yeah, so we do a lot of different types of trainings. Um, 
implicit bias trainings is one of the types of trainings that we do, plus trainings around microaggressions and bystander intervention. Um, we also do trainings around harassment hostile work, the, the, what I just talked about, harassment in the workplace, um, both sexual harassment and racial harassment. Uh, we do trainings around harassment, bullying, mm -hmm. and hazing in schools. Mm -hmm. uh, we do uh, trainings around housing discrimination and what the fair housing laws are as well. Okay, so um, so um, uh, what is, um, to you, it's in, in, well first of all, through the H3, you know, all the things you just talked about through H329, in um, cases, do you have a lot of cases around? Um, you know, you know, I don't know how to give me. You just, I'm just asking. Do you have a lot of cases that you're working on through um, discriminations and um, um, individuals who might have worked in their jobs and and quit because um, somebody might have dis re disrespect, you know, yeah. um, disrespect them. Yeah. Do, do you have cases like that? Right yeah, now? we get close to about, uh, we're processing up close to like 70 cases a year oh, of wow. discrimination. Wow. Yeah, and they're across all protected categories mm -hmm. and stuff. Um, this year has been kind of a funny year because of COVID-19, right. uh, but prior to that, our numbers have been pretty steady. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, <clears throat> you know, I, I don't, um, this is probably what something you, I don't know if it's included with your um, objectives, um, but you know, you know, with the um, Black Lives Matter and um, all this thing with Floyd and yeah. um, well, not this, the death of Floyd yeah. and um, discriminations around the country. Um, um, so what? Do, what do you, you know? And so everybody start hiring, hiring um, equity and in inclusion directors. And so this is just what do equity and inclusion means to you? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we both of color here, you know. Right. And so I'm, um, and um, maybe I can. I'll answer that question too. If yeah. What it means to me, but what what does it mean to you? Yeah. Well, that's that's a great question because it it means a lot of different things to me, mm -hmm. but it also means different things to different people. Yeah, it does. I yeah. would say that, um, and then I want to respond to the way that we are responding to what happened after George Floyd was murdered too, and hiring different equity and inclusion directors. But before I do that, I just wanna say that equity and inclusion in the broadest sense is really about people's, each individual's ability to truly fulfill their life's calling regardless of their skin color, regardless of their gender orientation, gender identity, regardless of their disability. And that the ability to sort of fulfill that calling and that promise upon their life without anybody else saying that they can't do that. And that to me is truly equity and inclusion. So thinking about like, how do we ensure that every person that is born is able to reach their potential is like fairness in school, equity and inclusion and inclusive like curriculum in schools. But also um, that a kid who's poor doesn't go to a school that is different from a kid who's rich, right? right? Yeah. And equity inclusion also means that when I apply for housing, that you don't ask me for a additional documentation than anybody else because mm -hmm. you look at me and you think I don't know if I can trust this person to pay the rent right, right? that's what equity inclusion means yeah. equity inclusion means also that you don't pretend that your housing is not available because you're afraid of uh, of me or you're afraid of the way that I look um, or that I won't take care of your property and equity and inclusion means when I apply for a job that I have the same fair chance for that um, but it also means like it's not just that simple too. It's also really about the availability of affordable, like where is the affordable housing? Do we have that? Equity inclusion is also about like, do I ha really have school choice, right? This isn't just about, oh, you can go to the school that's located in your neighborhood. This is about like, if that's not working for me, do I have the same choices as anybody else to go to any other school as well? Um, and do I go to school and, and come out with huge debt? Right. Right, so that when, even though I'm applying for the job and you're saying you're giving me the same chance, uh, the salary that you're paying me isn't enough to pay for that and to make up for years of poverty that I've lived in. So equity inclusion is looking at all of those things together. Mm -hmm. Now, the murder of George Floyd, and like I told you earlier, I was, um, I call Minneapolis my home, right? So I, I, like George Floyd was murdered like blocks 
from where I grew mm. up and where my family still lives. And it was an incredibly trying time this year, not only because of COVID, but because of all the uh, protests and the uprisings that were happening um, in my neighborhood and wanting to support that and also seeing this beautiful neighborhood like go up in flames and sort of all the yeah. conflict that you feel when you're yeah. seeing all of this and it's both sad and beautiful yeah. and like uh, amazing in different ways. But sometimes our response to that is superficial. Our response is let's hire one person mm -hmm. to handle this work. And the reality is, is that it is not the job of any one person. No, no, Certainly, it's be everybody, it's, it, yes, right? it is yeah. everybody's job. On, uh, on the other hand, when it's everybody's job, sometimes it's nobody's job. So I love that we are hiring people yeah. so that that person is at least charged with gathering people to do this work. <laughs> but I want to talk a little bit about people of color doing this work too, right? Because as a person of color who heads this agency, and I'm the first person of color. Awesome. Yeah, in the last 30, like uh, this I'm agency, so yeah, it has been here for 30 years, and I'm the first person of color. It's a great burden. To, to do this work as a person of color too. Because when you go out there, you talked about Karen doing this know your rights training, right? I would imagine, and, and I love Karen, she's amazing in every way, but when I go out there and I do this training and there are people that question like, oh, is it that bad though? You know, is discrimination really that bad? Aren't we just being overly sensitive? Isn't it such a big deal? I imagine that when my predecessors heard that, it doesn't have an impact on their personal lives. Right. When I hear that, I do feel <laughs> I get it. No hurt doubt about it. No doubt and harmed about it. by those yeah, comments. But I'm also in. I'm wearing the hat of educator. God, you gotta be. Um, you gotta be who you. You you have to have you really thick skin. Your, yes, you have to stay focused. And, yes. Yeah. So I, I I understand. You know because. Yeah. Um, it's tough. I understand. Like somebody talked to me uh, that looks like me and say that they use the words racism. This was happening. They, some, it was a racial. And I, I, right then, automatically, I, I get all warm. My physiology, I get all warm. I feel hurt. I yeah. mean, I, it didn't even happen to me. But right. I understand how you feel. Right. And nobody who I know is going to use the word racism if they don't mean, even if they don't feel it and mean it. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And so, so that brings me back to. Uh, <clears throat> Well, still on equity and inclusion, is that um, you know, I'm a little, I'm kind of, I'm kind of open, you know, I'm kind of still open on about it because, like you said, it means many things, you right. know, and um, and so, but I, you know, equity and inclusion, you know, okay, thank, thank God or higher power, or whoever it is, that um, where we're hiring equity and inclusion and diversity directors and people who are teaching cultural competencies mm -hmm. trainings, thank, thank the whoever doing that, but the thing is. Um, like I know, should the cultural competency person directly be a person of color? And, and another thing, and if, well, is it all about cultural competency? Is it all about um, people who just look like us? You know what I mean? And we, there's still a lot of people who don't look like us fall into the economically high risk demographics, you know, more of them yeah, actually than, than we do, than we are. And so, so what is, so is equity, and, and inclusion is is it really inclusive? And then the people who are trained to, or doing it, should, like I said, should they be a person of color? Because if you can't, like I was talking about somebody using, like you said to me, Bruce, racism, I'm, I'm like, shit, let's go. we might have to go all down on the block, or something back on the back on um, 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 in Hennepin County and in, you know, in Minneapolis and kiss all my peeps together. You know what I mean? Because that don't feel good, mm -hmm. and it comes from the feeling of, like for me, 400 years of slavery and more, you know what I'm saying? It comes to where I learned civil rights movement and all these things. So all those feelings come in my own um, things that happen to me, you know what I mean, personally. stuff. So that all comes like that. And if you're not, if you can't feel none of those things, how can you direct the equity and inclusion program? Yeah. How can you even do it? And I know some white people are doing it. I'm not saying that they, I don't know what their curriculum is or their agendas are, but I don't know. And they teach it in the school district. And I'm thinking, oh, no, but, you know. <laughs> I don't know what they teach. Right. I got, I'm, actually, I'm going to be sitting there in some of those yeah. classes just to see. Yeah. That's some, of the, some advisory boards around there. But so if it's all about people of color, equity, and inclusion, you really need to get the training first. You know, how can you really, how can you help people of color if you don't even, can't feel it? You got it. So you need, and then you're getting your equity and inclusion training from uh, somebody um, 
who's a white, whatever. So just like, and I said on the Vermont State Police, for impartial policing, right? And so, you know, I, went, so I did the tour of the different stations, you know, and, um, and my goal wasn't to ask about fair and partial police. It was like, how do you work with the community? So I did these ride alongs. But one, one, I did go in one police station with the chief, a chief, and, uh, and I was talking, and he took me to the de detective bureau. And I just kind of felt it funny, you know what I mean? You know, kind of weird. I mean, I don't know. That don't, what, what does that mean, right? And so, so I just asked him, say, yo, did you take the fair and partial police training, you know? You know, and he said, yeah, I, t I said, oh, that's great. How long did it take you? He said, about an hour. I said, about an hour. He said, yeah, we did it online. Mm -hmm. I think you, you do the fair part of police on your line? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, no. And most affected people, a lot of affected people around police work is people who look like me. Mm -hmm. And you didn't, you didn't have nobody come to do a role play. You didn't come out actually who looked like me, talk to you about some of the uh, cause and effect, the hurts that, um, that happens around you know, fair and part, you know, work that you might discriminate against, you know, discriminate against us where you didn't have nothing like you got it online and the person who, who probably created it online, I don't know, mm -hmm. probably wasn't a person who looked like me, you know. And so that that bothers me, you know, that's that bothers me a lot yeah. still. You know, and so that's type the same thing. How can you learn something, you know, or really get better at anything if you don't really work with the people that's affected, right? Mm -hmm. And so I guess that's a for me, with the inclusive, they, everybody in the world hired them. And I'm thinking, like, maybe they hired them because they say they got somebody doing the work, you know. Mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. and, I, and I know two white people in this, count, in this county who's do, doing the work. And, uh, and, I'm, and I'm like this, you know, like wondering, how the hell you can, you, you didn't ask me a question. You know, all the boards and stuff I said with the um, anti-racism committee, no one asked me nothing, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. it was, I don't say I'm, I'm not saying that I'm better than nobody because I'm not. But mm -hmm. I will have some answers, you know, I, mean, I can yeah. help you with your objectives and your agenda and, you know, maybe I can go to a school with you, sit down with mm -hmm. you. People see me, they, and they, you know, they, they, they feel better, they can, you know, they get it, you know, they'll get it better, you know. Yeah. And so, so, so the equity inclusion part is, you know, it means many things to me. Now, I just want to uh, talk to you a minute about um, the COVID-19, right? Yeah. Um, pitiful, right? God, so many people died. Across the world, you know, it's, you know, but my, I always got to, you know, my degree in St. Cloud, I always got to find out what's, what's, what's some good that seemed to be bad, you know, you, even though that's the pitiful, that's the worst ever, you know, things have been worse than that for in our world, too, you know, all the type of viruses and diseases, too, you know, um, like you don't even hear nothing about HIV and AIDS anymore, you know what I mean, and um, <laughs> I guess um, it, it, it's cured, you know, but anyways, um, and that's a, a pandemic virus, you know, I'm just using that as an example. Um, and so, um, for me, like um, COVID nineteen, what you know, you got, pitiful as it is, you still got to find something good about it. What it did, what I think, what what, what happened good about it, and you can, you know, I'm just asking this general question, and we just can discuss it for a minute. Is that people had to stay home, right? Couldn't go out the house. Mm -hmm. Had your fourteen day had to stay in the house, mm -hmm. and then they had that, that law like stay in your house. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. then, then they say, okay, you soft, and they said, okay, you can. You can actually walk your dog outside, or you can go out and get some air. You can go to the grocery store or the doctor's office, blah, blah, blah. You know, and wear your mask, stay six feet apart. And so, um, but mostly, I think people got a chance. They looked at TV a lot or listened to radio a lot, you know, and I think they got a chance to understand the plight of the world, you know. They, you know, oh, they, they're looking at the dis history of um, discovery. Oh, they had, uh, there's a frog with four legs, you know what I mean? Whatever, yeah. even that. But also um, learn about, um, like, Floyd, learn about the plight of um, bl what Black Lives Matter mean, learn about uh, other countries and cultures and ethnicities that they, did, they didn't know. Uh, oh, the Indians are this, oh, this, that, no. You know, that they didn't really know nothing about. They had to time to look at these things. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't no rush through looking because what, what else they going to do? They sat right. there and listened to it. Yeah. So I think because of that, COVID was just, you know, the worst thing in the world ever. But there, you got to find what's good about what, what's, what's bad. And um, I think that um, people want to come out. They want to volunteer more. They want to um, do more for their neighbor. They understood the plight. And they they want to um, help. You know, um, uh, celebrate this. I can use Black Lives Matter and um, in in all kind of different ways. And they was marching by the thousands. Right. For, you know, for Black Lives Matter. And it, was, it seemed like it was more white people or non uh, black colored people. 
uh, that was out there. Mm -hmm. I'm like, how wonderful is that? Mm -hmm. So, um, so I think that what made things a little better. You know what I mean for people who look like us. Um, that um, people under, got to understand him, of yeah. course, and then and they got to understand some of the history because yeah. they definitely didn't read none of our history. No dago. Right. I don't know about uh, um, Columbus mm -hmm. history and all mm -hmm. those false history yeah. stuff. Um, you know, um, and they nobody knew about African American history. Yeah. They didn't know about well, none of that. You know what was really am amazing about all the uprisings and social media and seeing it this year was that you're right, it, it did wake a lot of white people up to not just what black people had been telling them that had been happening for generations, but for the first time we saw them getting out there and doing it, and they were getting pushed and shoved by the police. So it wasn't that they were just reading it and they were like learning about it through their friends, um, but they were actually experiencing right. some of that violence themselves firsthand for doing nothing but protesting. And that to me is important because the way that we really change is not through like it, these teachings and training. That's important, but that's not enough. Mm -hmm. It's through experience yeah. and the experience that we take on that are similar to other like marginalized communities, right. people's experience. And I want to go back to what you said. I don't know how much time we have, Bruce, Let's but okay, yeah, I want to go back to what you said about um, equity and inclusion and education and stuff. And this is like a really important point. We do enforcement at the HRC and we do education at the HRC and we're working hard to try to change the laws at the HRC, but that's not enough. Mm -hmm. Like s there are some very important things that like we sort of have to, to recognize is that there are some basic needs that are not met in various communities and that those needs have to be met. So when I'm fighting for a discrimination free housing in Vermont, it's not enough we have a law that says anybody can go buy anywhere they want to. That's not realistic because not everybody makes the same amount of money. Not everybody can get this job. People are prejudiced against them because of their name before they even get in the right, door. Exactly. And because of student loans, because of poverty, because of all of these things, they never got into the right schools. They have tons of student loans. So like you look at that and they're already so behind so you can put a law in place that says, it's sort of like in the 1960s and 70s, we passed this law that says, oh, by the way, regardless of your race and color, you can now buy anywhere you want. Well, <laughs> Where that but there, where's the money? <laughs> Show me that where's, money? Where's the money to buy in where, anywhere I want? Right. Like, that's not realistic. That's not realistic. And so like one of the ways that you mitigate housing discrimination in Vermont isn't just passing a law that says no more discrimination in Vermont. And it's not, let's teach white landlords not to discriminate. That's not enough. No, no. You need to have more affordable housing in Vermont because when there is a, a more affordable housing and people of color go out there and they look for that housing and they have the competitive edge because they they don't need to it and someone discriminates against them against them they don't have to take that housing they can go somewhere else and file a complaint against them right now the the housing market is so scarce so low wow. that if i go and apply for housing and that landlord is discriminating against me, do you think I'm gonna uh, like complain against that landlord? I need that housing. Right. I need that housing for my kid. And why? That housing is connected to transportation. That housing is connected to where I go to school. Right. That housing is connected to my kid's school and my job. I'm not going to immediately file. And even if like I got the housing, would I really file right away? Right. No, because I need that housing next year. Right, exactly. Right? So like we are already at a detriment Right? We have to be looking at equity and inclusion by not just looking at education, because that's what people love to do. People go, let's do a bunch of implicit bias trainings, which I'm all for, I'm an educator. I'm for that, it is not enough. Let's keep enforcing the anti-discrimination laws, that's good too, that is not enough. We have to build housing, we have to have inclusive schools. Kids cannot live in poverty anymore. All of these things have to be happening simultaneously for there to be true equity and inclusion. And then I wanna talk a little bit about white people's place in doing this work and people of color's place in doing this work, right? On the one hand, I do absolutely believe that white people need to teach other white people. 
right? Because it's a huge burden on people of color to do this work all the time. And like I mentioned earlier, like it feels traumatizing sometimes to keep doing the teaching and teaching right. and teaching right, and people it. not listening. Sure. On the one hand, I it isn't so much that I look like this and therefore you should choose me, but usually this identity is connected to lived experiences. Right. This identity is connected to typically poverty. This identity is connected to discrimination. This identity is connected to disenfranchisement. And this identity is connected to like overcoming barriers. Those lived experiences are essential to delivering the message in a way that people will get it. Like, so what, like when I teach implicit bias, it isn't this theor theory. I really talk about like, this is my experience. This is what happened to me. When I was walking through this office, someone made an assumption that I wasn't a lawyer, but made an assumption that this person who's next to me who's white was a lawyer. <laughs> That's what I'm talking about. I don't think that white people, because of their privilege as white persons in this country, have those experiences to draw from to demonstrate that. That doesn't mean that there isn't a place for them to do this work. Mm. There is. But I think it's also important to recognize where are our experiences and knowledge base and where does that come from right. and how do we teach ourselves yeah. too. And how do we convey that message in a way that is meaningful? Right? How do we engage people about that that is meaningful? So, um, yeah. How do you, so how do you think, um, because uh, like, you know, we're, we're saying the same things here. And um, yeah. I think white people should teach white, their, their, their peers too, mm -hmm. by getting the information from a person like you and me first. Mm -hmm. They get trained from my, and then they go, to your, you know, train their peers. Um, so I, I'm just trying to figure out how, how this is all going to work. You know what I mean? Like how we, you know, like if they don't do it the, the ways that you just described, whatever, yeah. you know, how they can get the competency, competency trainings, mm -hmm. and where they can train their, whoever, their peers or people at work or, the other social services or whatever. I know you, you work with social services as well, right? Uh, n not directly. Not directly. But yeah. Mm -hmm. okay, so I, I just, you know, you know, you know, and I hear a lot of white people, you know, say that um, they really want to help people who look like us. They want, they want to do something. They really want to. But personally, I don't want you to do, if it's not about, um, um, you know, like, helping out with some funding or programs or for youth and families or whatever, then that's easy to do. But if you, you know, if you need help to really want to do, if you need help to want to do something like social or something like that, then you need to talk. Just don't go out and do it. Go talk to a person of color first. Ask them what they think they need, what they need first. Mm -hmm. Just like they should do. They right. just sort of can't go out and say, I did yeah. this, you know, um, mm -hmm. I, I took, you know, we did this in the black neighborhood or whatever neighborhood it was, a person of color neighborhood. And um, but they could have used that time for something else if we had if they had spoke with people like us. You know what I mean? Because that's that's thing. I, one way that's going to get better is that. Um, and you know, this is amazing too. I'm just you know we just talking now. It is amazing too. Like um, like um, I, and I'm a Democrat. You know, I'm you know I, you know I'm I'm um. You know, that's where I've been all, pretty much all my life, you know, but I look at other candidates to see what they've done for the community or work with youth because I work, I'm a youth service provider as well. And, uh, but the last election with the president, like with uh, Trump, the things he said and did, you know what I mean, and, um, you know, um, you know, what he said about, I can grab a woman here, I can shoot somebody mm -hmm. in this street, and, you know, and sto you know, all these things he said, you know what I mean, he stormed, that, stormed the Capitol and when his vice president in it, all this. Um, and all the things he did, you know, bluntly, right, right in your face. It wasn't like I didn't mean that. Yeah. It was like right in your face. Still, like half Americans voted for him. Mm -hmm. How did how that happen? I mean, how did how did that thinking come about? I mean, what was what is they didn't think? What, how did they put they had to put blinders on? I mean, how can you tell your I uh, voted president and the president saying? Kind of saying, I can grab any woman by anywhere as I'm not part of her body, and that's okay. Or, you know, things, he, not just things that really I think that women should really, should have really looked at, I mean, and all the abusive things he's done to women and um, people of color, you know. He just, he just amassed tons of 
negatives, you know. Mm -hmm. And while he was in office, he just shut this down. Don't let those people in. Just, you know, close that off, mm -hmm. you know, all that. But before that, how did he even get those votes? How did people, why did they vote on him? Do you have any answers for that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, well... <laughs> I mean, I, I, in, in some ways, this is not the full answer, but in some ways, I think this is still a very racist and sexist country. And half um, the people vote on Lauren. Right, right. Let's yeah, go absolutely. And there's no doubt that some of the people that voted for Trump are racist and sexist, right? Let's, that we're not going to joke about that. I would That's say all real. of them because. Um, right, because, okay. There okay. are people that would say that. I would also say that a lot of it is propaganda in that. One of the things that um, politicians, particularly politicians who have a lot of money, are able to share this, to, to put out this propaganda of fear. Be afraid of the Mexicans. Be afraid of the blacks. Yeah. Be afraid of the Asians during COVID. Be afraid of this. But don't fear me, this rich, white billionaire who couldn't care less about you you, who is a poor white Vermonter. Right. Nevertheless, right. you should vote for me because right. you should really be scared of all these other people. We spent oh. so much of our time fighting each other rather than really fighting people like Donald Trump. And that's because they've done a really good job in all of our history in making us point fingers at each other. And that is true, Bruce, too, not just of poor white people who are fighting us, but that's also true of black people and Asian Americans in this country too, is that we sometimes have had a history where our people have pointed the fingers at each other instead of pointing the finger at really a system and a group of people, particularly rich white people who have put us in these positions, right? And so I think if most, Amer most Americans make less than $250,000 a year, if most Americans got together, like, we could really change it, but instead we spent all this time, all this history really fighting each other. And I think that's what Donald Trump was really good at, is selling this idea that you should be scared of these Mexicans because they're coming here to rape you, that's what he called them. And you should be afraid, uh, like you don't want women to have power and that's why we can do whatever we want to them. And you should be afraid of black people and et cetera, et cetera. And that sells because it's, because it's fear. It's fear induced. Um, so yeah, and fear fear is something that drives a lot of people. Yeah, I know, I get it. I mean, I mean, I get I get what you're saying, but yeah. I still, still kind of like don't get it, you know. But I no, I, I I mean, I there are days where I'm like, I don't get it either. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, <laughs> yeah. So so um, so so here's Obama, right? He was yeah. from Chicago, not far right. from my where I was lived in, yeah. in High Park. But anyways, um, here's a here's a president mm -hmm. who ran for presidents. Yeah. Where if I don't know why he even did it. It was the worst time for anybody as a president. Three wars, we was in a recession, and he and he he won. But I'm thinking, man, mm -hmm. you got your hands for well, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and so, so what he tried to do revitalize the economy, right? And everybody was like, oh, he's, he you know um, um, was t to take the money that the couple of dollars we had in the bank, you know, I mean, the, the you know government had, the federal government had in the bank and use it to um, build our infrastructure. You know, like do our roads and bridges and get, and then this well, this will stimulate the system by people getting, you know, having jobs for in many ways, like mm -hmm. in many areas, because you need supplies, you need how you're gonna make the, you need rocks and you need all kind of different things, so, you know, to build roads and bridges, you know, and it create a lot of job marketing jobs, because you need, you know, and um, to um, stimulate our system and bring, get the money back. And I thought that was one of the smartest things that he could, somebody could have thought of. You know what I mean? To just spend the money on ourselves, man. Yeah. Instead of, you know what I mean? Investing yeah. that in Las Vegas or something. You know what I mean? Let's spend it on ourselves and, um, and, and, and enrich ourselves by doing this. And um, so they're like, oh, God, the economy, he's, he's it's a trillion dollars now. And, you know, he's, he's spending all the money. And uh, he's making, I'm like, what? He caused uh, two of the wars, and he had, they were already there. You know, yeah. he caused a recession. Everybody was saying these things about him. Yeah. Not to mention that they, that he was born in Africa or some some right, citizenship right, wasn't right. even. Great. So yeah. he, you know, he was very um, smart. I don't know what he said in the, mm -hmm. well, how he talked in the shower with the water running. You know, he, blah blah blah. blah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> he probably did. Yeah. You know, Michelle kept him straight too. But um, and then but, so here's a smart guy. Then here now. Um, Trump, 
who didn't really want to revitalize because he didn't want to spend out the money. I don't know why he, how he felt. He thought it was his money, first of all. He thought it was his money, you know, for our money that we have in the federal government. And he didn't really want to spend it, but he had to. He had to kind of um, revitalize the, um, our states, our government, you know, by spending money, giving money, and spending money, right? He, he, and um, he had to do it, you know. But, you know, at, you know I hear him, nobody say nothing about, oh, our budget is going, right. you know, our, what do you call it, deficit is going to yeah. <laughs> nothing, zero. It was all right, yeah. you know. So, you know, there you have it, you know. He thought, he, obviously, he took the same idea right. and used it, you know. And just like with um, Obamacare, he, he he's done nothing with he, he, it. Right. It's the best thing that Obamacare could, people could have done for people who, um, uh, citizens of the yeah. United States, you know what I mean, and um, yeah. and he could it, it was it it was stupid for him to even try to mess with it. And he and he nothing he could have done with it. nothing he's right. done with it because he can't. It just don't make no sense. It's the dumbest thing anybody could do, you know, to tr try to take that away from the people who who need that care, and, or unless they're gonna die, right? Die. Yeah. You know, and uh, so I'm glad Biden won, and whatever. Uh, but so I don't know. We're going through some some, some interesting times, you know. We are. Yeah. So um. What are some of your measurements, you know, before we close the show out and you get, and you get your uh, final words, what are some of the measurements you feel that you, which you're proud of that the Human Rights Commission have um, accomplished, you know what I mean? You know, I mean, you know, what, what, do, you, what do you think you so far, you know, what, you know, who's got the bronze, who's got the silver, who's got the gold right now? Yeah, yeah. I mean, what, what, what do you think, what do you think is your, like your, your you know, your, the yeah. best measurements you have right now yeah. of, of winning? Ooh, that's a really great question, um, and I struggle with that that on a regular basis. I just want to say that, like, I'm not here for the paycheck or for the title. Mm -hmm. This is really meaningful work to me personally, and um, it matters to me. And I take my job very seriously, and I'm going to work really hard for this whatever amount of time that this job is in front of me to do my best to mitigate discrimination. And so the ultimate measurement is always, has discrimination been reduced? But I'm not, like, I don't have any false hope that all of that was, is within my, my agency's authority. Like I mentioned, I don't have control over about affordable housing or the employment opportunities. I only have jurisdiction over preventing discrimination or pro uh, prohibiting, dis enforcing, enforcing the anti-discrimination laws. So, um, it is my hope in my time that we will put out some really important cases to demonstrate what discrimination looks like. It's my hope that we'll do a fair amount of education. Um, it's my hope that we'll pass some really good laws during my time to change the way that we look at discrimination. And while today I only talked about H329, there are also some really good bills right now around BIPOC land ownership around reparations, around truth and reconciliation. And these are all incredibly meaningful bills to me too, uh, to try to see what I can do to get these bills passed during my time as an executive director as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, you know, that's, those are great topics, you know, yeah. that you're gonna be working on. And I appreciate, I appreciate that, the work you're doing, you know. I think, you know, that's so important, you know I mean? You, you, I know you got a lot, you got a lot to do and a lot going on, you know. Wow, it's a lot, you know. So you really gotta, I don't know how you, what, how you put it in order, you know. Day uh, by day, yeah. <laughs> if you wake up. Yeah, you <laughs> just do it again. Just do it, yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah, and she got a good team. I right? do. You got a good mm -hmm. team, huh? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and see, you are guys are statewide. Yes, yeah, course, we cover the whole state the of Vermont. this level, yeah. central level. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this whole state of Vermont, which is gigantic. Yeah. So now let me ask you a question, because this, so if you, I don't, I can't even name no towns, but the, the, the thousand, the one horse town in Vermont, you know, whatever town that could be, I'm yeah. just saying. Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. It's got to be something, not necessarily, you know, yeah. in theory. Um, do you get any uh, complaints or um, from those, these people from, from like five thousand? Yes. Wow. Yes. And, it's, and be, would it be more like housing or job or discrimination? All or? of those. Really? All of those, yeah. Because, I mean, we get housing all over the state mm -hmm. because we have a lot of single landlords in the state of Vermont who don't really know what they're doing or know the laws, right? And in Vermont, people rent through word of mouth. And it, and 
the truth is, is that most landowners and property owners are still white. So if you're renting through word of mouth, you're mostly renting to other white people. Um, and so we're, we're getting those claims all over the state of Vermont. People who also don't understand the laws around disability and reasonable accommodations and needing to accommodate someone may, who might be in a wheelchair, who needs a ramp, right? right? So we get that right. all over the state. It doesn't matter the size. School cases come also from all over the state. Mm. Um, and uh, police cases come from all over the state. Of course. Too. Yeah. So Nobody is immune to discrimination in Vermont, no matter what town, how big or how small it is. So I sit on this uh, committee through the Winooski School District called um, Anti-Racism yeah. Committee. And I'm um, working with the superintendent, the principals, youth, and mm -hmm. you know, community members. And then they had some six, we had, well, we had nine demands, so we got six now. But anyways, um, It'd be nice if, like, you know, like, know your right type deal. It'd be nice if you or can come into one yeah. of our meetings at the um, Winooski uh, School and yeah. just talk to these youth about... I would love to. Oh, great. Yeah, that, absolutely. That, that'd be awesome. Yeah. I really appreciate it. I because, would love to. Because as we make decisions on um, around um, anti-racism, because they got, like, you know, mm -hmm. hire more people of color, you know, right. different, you know... Right. RFO, you know, uh, uh, resource officers, how they should be in school, right. you know, these type of things. They should have a, they should um, all go by their um, culture, cultural experience, you know, like me, slavery mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. racial discrimination and stereotypical things people have said or done. They shouldn't just go by it. They need to have some real facts to be, too. They need to have to balance that. They, I want them to have a real, make real good decision yeah. about the um, laws we're going to change in the school district. Yeah. You know, before they actually, um, you know, they need to hear both sides of the coin. You know, they need yeah. to hear more, not both sides of the coin, but more information, both sides of the coin, I guess, but yeah. more information about before they make the decision. So I would love to Absolutely. put it, we'll talk about it. I'd love to put you on the agenda and come in and talk to you. Yeah, kids. I, I would awesome. love to do that. Yeah. They, they're going to love you as well, you know, because um, it's, it's so important. Yeah, you know, it really is. You know, because yeah. you know, they can get be angry. You know, I could be like, I'm angry about a lot of things, like, you know, like, but anger motivates us, yeah. and and it's okay. Yeah. And there is such a thing as like righteous anger, yeah. you know, which sure. motivates us to do good work. Yeah. And so, I think that's good. Yeah. Like for, I'm just gonna tell you one. Like in, in um, uh, one of our one one of our black high school teachers resigned. Mm, yeah. And he's the only one in, in Winooski School District. Yes. He resigned, and he yeah. and he used the word racism. Mm -hmm. And he was on our committee, you know. Yeah. And so. Well, anyway, so, you know, yeah. you, you get how I'm feeling about that. So, and so you know, and our number four demand, four demand is to hire more people of color. And here's how other got cut out on us, I mean, a high school teacher. Right. I think they gave other people of color in, like, in the middle school and elementary school, but not, you know, not people not like look like me. Um, we need to talk about not just hiring more people of color, but how do we retain people right. of color exactly. in all of these systems and institutions and in the state of Vermont? We can bring them in, but if they are being harmed while they just start to do the work and start questioning stuff, people will just leave. One of the things that, I know you've been here a long time, but one of the things that I struggle with is community, right? Because I'm living like two hours from here and you live here and I may not see you, Bruce, for months at a time and we, we're operating maybe on, like doing the same work, but isolated yeah. here and siloed here. And it, in Chicago or Minneapolis, your community is right there. Right there. So it's not that discrimination like doesn't happen in Minneapolis or Chicago, of course it does, but your community is right there to back you up. Yeah. Here, there's like a yeah. lack of that kind of community. So if we bring people of color here, and you hire only that one person of color and you think your job is done at that school in that little town that you talked about, like that person who is experiencing harm doing this work is then going to like leave mm -hmm. in a year or two. Right. And I think we need to be like realistic about not just hiring, but retention no, no, as no, well. No, no, no. And that's, what, yeah. that's one of the things we're talking about now in this group. So you have anything else you wanna to add to our show? I think we've had a really great discussion. Yeah. I, I'm honored that you invited me to no, to no, no, no. to talk today, and I'm um, you know after all these years, I still feel really excited about doing this work, and yeah. so um, we're just gonna keep no, that's good. keep moving. Yeah, I'm glad you're still excited, you know, because you know, like you said, you know, 
you, you name a lot of different areas that you work yeah. within, you know, that you do, and um, a lot, you know. And so, um, thank God you can just go to those, you know, you can like, I don't feel like working on that one. I'm going to work on this <laughs> policy change or something. Right, you know, right, or yeah. Housing, you know, yeah. Just, you can work on those instead of, mm -hmm. you know, you yeah. feel better and get back to the other one. You know, so, <laughs> right. So that's, that's, that's so good about it. But um, so we're going to invite you. Um, um, to um, to this, you know to That's our committee else on your body and um, hopefully you'll come back on yes. the show. Uh, really appreciate you. You know um, you. I'm going to be doing an education series here with um, um, CCTV Town Meetings coming soon. I hope to bring Wonderful. you back and talk okay. about education around you know whatever yeah. topics that we can Excellent. come up with. Okay. Right, Thank boy. you. Thank you for coming on the show. Thank All you. Right, have a good Bye. day. Thank you. Bye.